Welcome to the Software People Stories. I'm Shiv. I'm Chitra. And I'm Gaiti. We bring you interesting untold stories of people associated with the creation or consumption of software-based solutions. You'll hear stories of what worked and sometimes what didn't. You'll also hear very personal experiences and insights that would trigger your thoughts and inspire you to do even greater things. Today, I am in conversation with Ved Prakash, the Chief Knowledge Officer at Ryan's Consulting. He talks about his education in engineering and how he grew as a techie to take on business roles as well. And one day, when he was asked to make knowledge management more effective in Wipro, and what he thought would be a two-year stint became a turning point in his career into knowledge management. He also goes on to talk about the challenges in bridging an engineering mindset among techies that may need clear specifications to the KM domain where many things would be exploratory. How, as a knowledge officer, he has been able to create an impact and what the key role for a knowledge officer is and the relevance of knowledge management in the context of startups where even simple techniques and practices could help them be a lot more effective. The role of knowledge management beyond organizational boundaries is something that he also touches upon and his thoughts on whether AI and ML will replace knowledge management professionals. And finally, the traits needed to be a successful KM professional and and the opportunities as a career in KM. Listen on. Hi, Ved. Welcome to the Software People Stories. I'm very happy to have you as the first person with uh, knowledge management experience who's going to be on the show. Thank you, Shiv. Thank you for inviting me on this podcasting channel of yours. I'm really excited to be a part of the journey that you have undertaken probably over the last 18 months or so, and uh, look forward to having a conversation with you, especially around my passion, which is knowledge management. Absolutely. I've known you for a while and uh, all the things that you've done, but for uh, the interest of our audience, it's good if you introduce yourself rather than me trying and doing a bad job of it. Sure. So I have been in the IT and consulting industry for 28 years now. Just to take you back in time, I did my engineering in computer science then did my MBA from IM Bangalore and joined Wipro, which was a startup at that time from campus. That was way back in 1992. So given my computer science background, I was associated with leading edge projects in Wipro at that point of time. Started as a developer, graduated to being a quality analyst, a business analyst, and then went on site, as was the norm those days in the IT industry. Everybody would go and work on client sites. So I was there for three years in UK, working with multiple clients. And over there, I was primarily associated with the energy and utilities domain and became a domain consultant as well, including representing the client I was working for in regulatory commission meetings. Then I came back to uh, Bangalore, which was my base in Wipro and started handling a large uh, client account, one of the largest in Wipro at that point of time. This was around the Y2K days where new technologies like data warehousing, etc., were coming up as well. And this was the time when Indian IT industry was moving from generic offshore services to vertical-based services. So I became the first practice lead for energy and utilities vertical in Wipro. I was the first guy to incubate it. And then happy that today it is a billion dollar business for Wipro. So I was uh, handling energy and utilities for a few years. Then I moved to healthcare and life sciences business of Wipro, which I handled for a couple of years. And that's when I was introduced to this particular thing called knowledge management. So it was interesting because healthcare business had grown to a, from, a, from a small size to a thousand plus people business. And one fine day, the chief global delivery officer of Wipro came into my cabin and asked about, okay, let's go into the canteen. I want to have a conversation with you. And that's where he was also a member of the executive council of Wipro. And that's where he said that, look, we are looking for someone to really shore up knowledge management in the company. It was already existing as a function, function, but it was something which was not making an impact, a very small function, which nobody knew about and all that. So he said that they have thought through carefully and found that this would be one of the strategic enablers for Wipro in the coming days. And this I'm talking of is uh, mid-2000s. Oh, okay. 
so the the precise year was 2006 uh, the beginning of 2006 when strategy planning happens and uh, my vertical healthcare and life sciences was going great guns it was like more than doubling every six months and there was a huge pipeline as well i was intricately involved in building business uh, besides handling delivery so so i asked him as to give me one reason why i should really move away from a vertical which is growing really really well seeing a lot of traction in the latest technologies and you know the latest business part of the uh, domain as well the healthcare business was opening up like nobody's business in the us so he said that so he explained to me how knowledge management was going to be one of the pillars of uh, further growth for wipro and how i would be the right fit in terms of having spent so many years in Wipro. By that time, I had already spent uh, more than uh, 13 years in Wipro. And also how I have been through multiple business cycles of the organization. Plus, it also had something to do with my individual personality traits. It's about being overall amiable, being able to network well, understanding both the sales as well as the delivery side of business intricately, having been exposed directly to both of them having been part of various organizational initiatives. And, uh, and Wipro was in a high growth phase even at that point of time. So, so they said that they have narrowed down on me. I had a couple of further meetings and then I was convinced. Now, the funny part was that I signed up for two years, saying that after two years, I'll come back to uh, the line functions. And now it is 14 years and I'm still very much in this field. And uh, really glad that I took that call off shifting away from uh, being in the day-to-day -day operations to something uh -huh. called a corporate function of knowledge management. Nice. So I was in this role in Wipro for six years. I spent a total of uh, 20 years in Wipro before I joined a UK-based company called Logica, uh, which had a pan-European presence. They were looking for a chief knowledge officer and they were tracking me for more than a year. They had actually reached out to me but once I completed 20 years and I realized the kind of value that one, you know, that gets built into the individual while working for an organization like Wipro, which had started with say 300 people when I joined versus the 170,000 people at the end of 20 years. Mm. So I thought probably I'll be able to give more of that value to another organization and joined Logica. Now, when I was in my notice period in Wipro, Logica was acquired by a Canadian IT consulting firm called CGI. They're pretty big. And uh, so they acquired and uh, the combined entity of CGI and Logica was actually larger in size than Wipro and Infosys. Oh. Didn't know much about it because more than one third of business of CGI comes from US federal. Because of that, they maintain a slightly low profile. And they okay. already were 12,000 people in India. So I did a bit of research and found that for me, the opportunity as the chief knowledge officer is doubly exciting because CGI also did not have anything as a legacy on uh, knowledge management. Okay. Plus, in addition, there was an opportunity to be an integral part of integration of two totally disparate entities because CGI was predominantly North America focused. Logica was uh, Europe focused. So there was a the unique amalgamation of two totally different cultures, totally different geographies, totally different way of approaching the customers that was coming in. And KM would play a critical role in that. So, so that was fairly exciting for me. I stayed in CGI for four and a half years, set up the foundation of KM over there, rolled it out in Asia Pacific as well as other geographies, working directly with uh, the headquarters in uh, Canada while still being based out of Bangalore. And then a chance meeting happened with uh, one of the boutique management consulting firms by the name of Trials, where I'm the chief knowledge officer currently. So someone called me up as part of a, a regular, uh, you know, chat that you do with your peers across the industry. So he said that the uh, founder and uh, chairman of the company is coming over to Bangalore of trials from the US, he's looking for a chief knowledge officer. Would you like to have a chat with him? So I said, why not? And we went over dinner, uh, spent several hours over there where the chairman of trials outlined the vision that the company has, how it fits into the digital transformation landscape that was emerging 
Uh, today it's a buzzword everywhere, but you know, a few years back that was not the case. I like what I heard, so uh, took the call of uh, joining Triance and three years uh, in Triance. I'm quite happy about having established knowledge management uh, in a totally different avatar over here. So that has been my brief corporate journey. On the uh, personal side, I have been in Bangalore ever since I uh, joined IM Bangalore. That was way back in 1990. So it's 30 years now, three decades. So I'm truly an adopted Bangalorean, like a lot of us in the industry uh, in the city. And prior to that, uh, I spent my life in a small university township called Pantnagar, which is in the foothills of Himalayas in Uttarakhand, a lovely place. So grew up in a very cocoon kind of an environment, uh, but a very intellectually rich environment as well, because it was a university township. So those have been the two distinct parts of my journey. Wonderful, Ved. As you were talking, probably every other sentence was triggering a few more thoughts and questions. And what I liked is also the way you were describing the transitions in your career. We're all primarily through conversations. And in the knowledge management space, we say that no, conversations are a rich form of exchange and uh, probably you know, coming to convergence or learning, etc. Now, That's right. having uh, the curiosity question one is um, having been a techie and like you said, in different verticals, etc., where uh, the engineering mindset of having everything specified, everything defined upfront to the area of knowledge management, where probably a lot of things are exploratory or you may be discovering some things accidentally. How did you adjust to this different way of either thinking or working? Yeah, good question and good observation as well, uh, Shiv Guru. So if you look at the engineering side of, you know, the work that is done in IT companies, uh, it's both an art and a science. And there's a lot of creativity involved when you are putting together a solution. So it all begins from the requirement stage itself. And I've been very fortunate to have interacted with a lot of clients over the course of my experience in carving out requirements from the client. Now, what they communicate to you is things that they want in simple English. And between that and delivering an application that is meant for the end users, there's a lot that happens where you have to interpret what they are saying, combine it with your own personal knowledge of how the business environment is, how the business processes are, interpret it in your own way, play it back to the customer, and uh, there again, the funny part is when you play to different stakeholders on the customer side, they will each have their own take on it, right? So how do you amalgamate it all together, bring out a cohesive picture, which is acceptable? You know, I wouldn't call it the LCM kind of a thing, uh, but that's what eventually it ends up doing. You have to really look at requirements coming from different angles put together a solution and so all that creativity that goes into even building that solution because there's nothing definitive in software engineering in a lot of ways. We could say that some of the processes are very definitive in nature, but when you're actually putting the code together or the way you're testing it, again, there's a lot of uh, art and creativity that goes into it. So right from day one, we have been involved in working in a slightly ambiguous kind of an environment, right? Yeah. And and the other thing that we have been, you know, it's a very people oriented business as well, where you have to continuously interface with people. Now, in the early days, yes, you're right. When you're in your year zero, year one in the industry, you're probably handed out some program specifications, which may be slightly prescriptive in nature, right? But even there, you can differentiate between developers who did a better job than someone else while being handed out similar kind of specs. And the answer was, how much were they able to apply their brain to interpreting what the customer would want? And also, you know, for example, something as simple as unit testing. When you pick up unit testing and you have to create unit test cases, how do you really look at getting complete coverage of the work that you have been allotted? Looking at the bigger picture as well, even though the bigger picture sometimes come in at the stages of, integration testing and uh, all that, right? Mm -hmm. But even then, that kind of a mindset really helps. Fortunately, I mean, again, probably I would thank my MBA for that. MBA as a degree course, uh, as a post-graduation course, I did not look at as yet another degree course. It was about my being exposed to 
diverse aspects of how an organization runs from the people aspects to the financial aspects to the sales and marketing aspect to the operational aspects right and in addition it also gives you the ability to scan the environment for things that are not written down so inherently it makes you a good knowledge oriented person i mean i'm linking it back to knowledge management which became my destiny down the line which i didn't know at that right. point of time and that mindset i carried from day one of my employment as well yeah i don't know whether it answers your question oh yes right? and then as i said now everything that you say triggers more questions for instance the person or the hr aspect that you brought in is also very significant in terms of getting the culture of sharing and learning which has to be i guess almost constant so as a knowledge officer or as a function responsible for knowledge management what have been some of the challenges or have you done something innovative uh, to break either the silos in a large organization or create this culture of sharing yeah so the fundamental essence of knowledge management is about building a knowledge enabling culture in the organization so we as human beings especially this is something i have seen in india more than you know western counterparts about the not invented here syndrome and that too in the software industry where a lot of software engineering people feel that unless they have written that code it won't work so bringing that element of trust into reusing what others have done is something which is part of the culture as well and obviously the other part of the equation is about sharing what you have created with others freely because one of the things that knowledge workers have in their minds is that if i give away whatever i know to others maybe my value in the organization will go down because right. everyone feels that they have a unique proposition that nobody else has in a particular team or a larger set of people right and they want to retain that uniqueness and they couldn't be further from the truth because if they start sharing freely voluntarily that's when people start recognizing them as experts quote and quote right that this person is the go to person for these kind of things but if they start hoarding knowledge first of all nobody knows that they have that knowledge second is they start creating a sort of a negative perspective for themselves that this is a person who won't really help even if he or she knows about such certain things right so it works both ways and my role as the chief knowledge officer in repro cgi or trials has been about building that culture where people freely come over and share their knowledge in various forms it could be documents it could be codes it could be sharing their experiences like this podcast of ours that is what and the second is consuming knowledge created by others yeah very important this is more like a provocative question some people say that knowledge management techniques basically say that you learn from history okay saying mm -hmm. what has happened what is uh, captured in some manner or shared in some manner but in the case of let's say startups where they want to go and create a future is there a role for knowledge management absolutely in fact even more so why i say that is that innovation see startups also are looking at providing something to the business environment to the economy something that is needed so we call it a problem sometimes the venture capitalists and others say what is the problem you are trying to solve and also what is the solution that you are bringing to the table and where's the innovation in that how are you going to differentiate from what is existing what is the delight that you are going to bring to the end consumer of whatever you are building it could be a product or a service or a platform or whatever else right so for that innovation to happen it doesn't happen out of thin air it's about analysis and synthesis of something that is already existing understanding the gaps and then coming up as to something different that can fulfill that gap of course you also have examples where you create a brand new market for which uh, probably there was no consumer demand because they didn't even, the consumers did not even understand what that product is all about so that's but here i am talking of where you are looking at fulfilling that gap and that's where knowledge management plays a key role where you need to assimilate all the knowledge that is already existing whether it's a startup or a existing going large organization so if i look at a wipro for example where i spent a lot of years two decades wipro had a traditional it business which was about large outsourcing and it's a no brainer that knowledge management plays a huge role over there because one of the benefits you are 
providing to the end customer is cost reduction year on year. And that can happen through productivity increases enabled through a lot of different tools and techniques which come from the knowledge management stable. But when it comes to innovation, you can look at incremental innovation or you can look at an innovation which is creating something brand new, you know, which doesn't happen that often. Uh, mm-hmm. For that matter, for example, if you look at a Wipro itself and you look at the offshoring model, Wipro, this was a disruptive innovation that happened in the early 90s when, you know, the telecom costs and those high speed lines from the US to India became a possibility due to innovations happening in the telecom industry. That caused a disruption in the way projects started getting delivered to clients outside of India. Otherwise, it was only about body shop when initially it had started. So disruptive innovation is not as common as incremental innovation in a lot of ways in organizations, right? And uh, knowledge management, uh, when it comes to innovation, one is the aspect of getting all the knowledge together, providing avenues where people can really look at interpreting the same knowledge in different ways, which in turn gives rise to new knowledge that leads to innovation. So that is something that product companies definitely need, right? Again, I'm not sure whether I'm on the right track of the question that you're asking. And I just wanted to understand that because in the startup world, there is a lot of crunch in terms of both the resources that they can deploy, whether it's in terms of you know, money or infrastructure, etc. And also there is a lot of pressure in terms of making progress or start earning revenue as soon as possible. There is a mm-hmm. time crunch as well. Right. Compared to, let's say, a larger organization and mm-hmm. because of its sheer size has a large number of maybe experts or expertise pools that can be leveraged. So for a startup, I and mean, I definitely agree with you that it is a lot more important, but I was just asking that question more to provoke your thoughts. Now, what do you think is the role of knowledge management beyond organizational boundaries? Maybe my question could have been phrased that way. Yeah. So, so Shivguru, coming back to the startups, I have mentored a few startups uh, through the route of NSR CEL, which is the entrepreneurship hub of IM Bangalore. So this is my way of giving back to the institute as well. And over there, I've interacted with uh, several startups on this area of knowledge management and how they can benefit from applying KM principles in their own little ways. So as a simple example, so I was meeting a group of founders. I mean, they're predominantly techies who are more focused on building a platform which they leverage for whatever their offering is. And uh, what I found, for example, was that there were three of them, the founding team, and they had maybe 10 other people as part of the startup. The three of them were involved in going to their target market segment, right? They were doing these meetings with them and everything was lying on their individual laptops, right? Now, they were also busy. Basically, in a startup environment, you know that you're a jack of all trades. You have to do everything, right? right? And you don't have that organizational support because you don't have an organization to begin with. So something as simple as just getting their leads together in a common place would be a big leap for them. So we found out, for example, just by conversations with them, it was discovered very quickly that they in their own minds and with their own experiences, with different uh, prospects that they had approached, there were a lot of learnings that they had derived. But they, those learnings were not being shared amongst the founders themselves, even though they okay. were meeting each other on a daily basis, <laughs> simply, simply because they were too busy doing jumping from one task to another. So give them a simple solution around how they can have a very crude rudimentary CRM system in place, which captures not only the prospects that they had approached, because again, there was an overlap happening. So the founder A and the founder B would go to the same prospect at different points of time and cut a sorry figure because the prospect would come back and say, look, you guys don't even know what you're doing. Mm. How do you believe that I can trust what your offering is? And both of you claim to be founders. So something as simple as pulling together their expert, uh, you know, uh, the people that they're approaching. And it doesn't take much time. I mean, it's about a simple, maybe introduce them to something like a Google suite and say you just start capturing your details over there. It's on the cloud. So you don't have to maintain it locally on your laptop. Do it on the cloud and let the other founders also have visibility to it. Or the technical team, 
for example the technical team again when it comes to startups especially which are technology oriented startups they keep changing their tech stack very often they keep experimenting uh, they are very nimble and agile in the way they work very responsive to what the market wants as well which can sometimes become their undoing also but but that's the need of the r as well because they are evolving in their early stages now one common pattern that emerged was that there's a lot of possibility of reuse of the code that they are building even though they mm. may be changing the stack mm. and again because the technology team is also very focused on day to day work rather than taking a step back and seeing whether they can organize just a bit better and it doesn't take much effort also they are anyway doing things right but which can give productivity benefits of the order of 40 to 70% wow so the benefits that can come out of bringing in some amount of order can be tremendous right or having those huddles even though they are co-located so uh, we all have seen those images of people uh, lounging around with their laptops and all that right <laughs> but they're so busy they don't really have time to again take that step back and look at what did they do right what did they do wrong right so even introducing some simple uh, you know scrum principles like having a 15 minute stand up meeting can actually be an, a huge jump for them in terms mm. of the outcomes that they achieve on a day to day basis so again so it's about uh, encouraging reuse in certain pockets having them document certain things in a particular way organizing those and we are not talking of sophisticated systems over here we are just saying that capture certain things as they come the other advantage that they have seen is that they also tend to see a churn of the technology teams if they are dependent on the technology team besides okay. the founders okay when the person walks out as we all say it's very cliche but knowledge walks out of the door it's mm. not just the individual coming in because you will finally get another developer coming in but there's a lot of tacit knowledge that resides in the person and if you're able to capture part of that through various mechanisms even for a startup it's very very valuable that makes a lot of sense you mentioned a couple of things about analysis and synthesis in this space and you also talked about the breakthrough innovation that happened in outsourcing because of the innovations in the telecom area mm -hmm. now today everybody talks about at least adding a few more letters right from their company names to their offerings which is ai ml etc etc right so do you see ai completely replacing the need for knowledge management professionals i look at ai adding to the overall value that knowledge management professionals are really adding to the organization so ai basically sits on top of knowledge which could be structured or unstructured or the organizational data that is lying over there so you combine ai with some amount of analytics that goes on top of that data add that to the overall knowledge base of the organization the human element would never ever go away is what i genuinely feel what ai is able to do is that it is able to look at vast amounts of data and knowledge documented knowledge and the streaming knowledge as well uh, we were talking earlier about the audio and video media becoming popular and how search engines are still not very capable of extracting things out of them right mm -hmm. so ai would be able to combine all the knowledge sources and data sources in the organization if it is structured appropriately and bring out insights from them but the knowledge management professional would still need to train that ai engine to work towards getting those insights out and delivering them to the appropriate audience so i think that part will very much remain right it's just the nature of job of knowledge management professional that will change today a lot of emphasis is on how do you organize the knowledge that comes in from various sources in the organization and all that we talk of taxonomies and metadata and all that probably the technologies of today right they would be able to automate a lot of that job they'll be able to decide what could be the organizational taxonomy today it's a human being who does that right tomorrow the human being would just validate what the system is proposing so that kind of a change would act, would occur if you look at the use of ai for example if you look at uh, gmail or even outlook that is used in enterprises i don't need to organize my mails into folders anymore the search is powerful enough to get me what i am looking for Mm. right not only that when i type a keyword it knows from what context am i typing that keyword and it will get me those results 
right? As opposed to a just an equal match happening with that keyword. So that is already visible in a Google search, a Gmail, in Outlook. Bing has been moving in that direction. I have worked extensively on enterprise Office 365 knowledge management tools that are there, tools and applications. And okay. that element is visible over there as well. The Microsoft Loi machine learning engine, that in the background is constantly building a persona for each individual based on who they are interacting with through emails, based on what kind of searches they are doing in the browser, based on what kind of documents they are working on on their laptops. It builds that persona and it brings out that relevant knowledge. So I think technology is advancing at a very rapid pace and the role of knowledge managers will change but they will not go extinct. Okay, that's very reassuring. As I mentioned, almost everything that you say triggers off multiple questions. But since we are constrained for time, I would like to ask one of my favorite questions to all our guests, mm -hmm. uh, which is essentially your advice to people who are considering getting into this line of knowledge management. First of all, you know, what are the, say, whether it is the skills or the individual traits that are needed for this? And uh, you've actually risen and been the CKO. So in terms of career, what can they look forward? Right. So one thing I would advise anyone who wants to enter into the arena of knowledge management, they necessarily need to be people's person. So they would need to interact with uh, literally everybody in the organization. And that's the beauty of this function. I love it because I get to interact with all the businesses, the geographies, the corporate functions, practically everyone. You have something to offer for everyone. So you have to be a people's person, very good in networking. The other core skill is that you should be self-motivated. There's nobody who's going to come behind your back and uh, you know pressurize you to deliver something. So you have to be motivated enough to continue providing value to the organization, continue providing an outcome to the respective stakeholders. So that is a very important thing. The other is that you should practice what you're preaching. So one needs to be on a constant learning path, share that learning with others. So you, you should be able to do that as well. You should have an ability to appreciate technology as well, because whether we like it or not, technology does play a role in uh, distribution, dissemination of knowledge and all that, especially in the services sector where knowledge management is a lot more popular compared to the other sectors. There also it is catching up big time, uh, but technology platform does play a role. So you should be sort of, you should have that inherent sense of curiosity to try out new things. How do you leverage on technology better? For example, the kind of podcast that you are doing to capture experiences of people is something that should be done internally in organizations as well to capture the tacit knowledge of uh, the experts, right? So these are some of the traits. In terms of a career path, when you enter, you could enter by probably looking at a specific aspect, uh, being mentored by a more senior knowledge manager. So it could be about around, for example, manage, managing the, the content that comes in the organization so that you get a hang of the richness of knowledge that lies, the variety of knowledge that lies in the organization, moving towards facilitating communities of practice. That is one term that did not come in our conversations, but plays an important role. So moving towards managing communities of practice, managing specific focused knowledge initiatives for different stakeholders. Move towards that and you see growth happening in that. So you could become a knowledge manager for an entire business unit or a chief knowledge officer for the organization. And it's a very undefined kind of a role in some ways. So innovation can become a part of that. It has huge overlaps with learning and development as well. We all know that we say that classroom learning accounts for maybe only 10% of the learning. 90% of it comes through interacting with others in practice and all that. And that is where knowledge management has a strength in. So you can continue widening your arena of influence as a knowledge manager and grow along with that. Being a People-oriented thing, there's an overlap with HR as well. A lot of, uh, you know, with quality. So you name the function and there's something for knowledge management over there. Yeah, that's very reassuring, way. And uh, since we are constrained for time, I'd like to thank you for the time taken and uh, all the insights that you've shared. But I'll assure you that the list of questions that I have has grown much longer now. So maybe take a rain check for continuing this conversation some other time. Sure. Thank you, Shiv Guru. I really enjoyed the conversation with you and look forward to maybe having a sequel to it later on. Thank you. Thanks, Ed.
We thank Siddharth for the music and Malavika for promoting the Software People Stories. If you like this episode, please subscribe on your favorite podcast client and spread the word in your network. If you'd like to share your story, contact us at podcasts at pm-powerconsulting.com.